There's a wonderful statement made by Paul in his second letter to the young preacher Timothy. And of course, it's only one statement that's great among many statements. But it says something about the design of the gospel and how we're converted and the results of that true, genuine conversion to Christ and to its impact upon us and even our minds. You know, the atheist says that a man has a brain, but he doesn't like to talk about the mind. A brain simply is an empirical fact. You can uh, cut a person up, open up his skull, and there's a brain. Somebody had to call it a brain somewhere back down the road, but before they ever knew to call it a brain, whatever they called it before them, some of the language, it was still doing what the brain does. And before they ever discovered different parts of the brain, it was still working before they ever labeled it. But then when it comes to the mind, atheists don't like to talk about that. Because it's not something that's material. And yet it's the thinking part of us. Connected to the brain, very definitely. How it's connected, don't know. Will we take the thoughts with us into eternity when we're no longer in time and space or in a material body? Yes, we will. We have revelation in the Bible that tells us that we can remember and we can communicate and we can think logically outside of the body well there's no brain there but there's mind there's mind but the gospel impacts even the mind when it comes to thinking straight and being whatever else we ought to be to ourselves Paul says here in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7 for God hath not given now notice that's past tense for God hath not given us, speaking of specifically Paul and Timothy, but Christians in general. But God hath not given us the spirit of fear. That's interesting. It doesn't say in this one verse how he has removed fear from them. But he says plainly, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Now, if I were a thinking person and I read that, I'd say, how does that happen? Well, he says in the rest of the verse, here's what he has given us. Rather than the spirit of fear, and that's what but in the sentence mean, but of power and of love. Now, here's it is. And of a sound mind. Greek means a wholesome mind. Well, that caused me to think immediately without the influence of God through the truth of God and the gospel of God and the word of God. I'm not apt to have the sound mind I'm capable of having and that God wants me to have. Now, there's a reason for that. Because if you don't take into your mind the thoughts of God, the ideas of God, your creator, then you're not going to have the proper perspective, first of all, of yourself, of God, or anything around you. Oh, you'll have thoughts about it because you're a thinking person. But you may have wrong thoughts about it. Remember, there is a way that seems right to a man, but what? The end thereof are the ways of death. So you can do a lot of thinking. You can even be called an intellectual, and you can go to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or somewhere like that and study the philosophy of the mind and get a Ph.D. in it and still not have a sound mind. Because when you principally study those things, you're studying what other men think so that you can think. And too many times that makes them think like the great philosophers as the world defines great philosophers think. And they may not even believe in God. Or Christ is a son of God. 
of the Bible as infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, and final revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 2, 3, 15, uh, 16, 17. Notice, Paul says we have this. He's given us power and of love and of a sound mind. That means if I want to know how to use the very power he gives me as a human being, because I have power to a certain extent or the other, I don't know how to use it, how to tap into it, where it comes from, if I don't let God tell me, and I'm not willing to follow what he says. Same thing true when it comes to love. The world calls everything love. Of course, the greatest love is always that which seeks another's good. And the ultimate good is to get man from earth to heaven. I don't have to go around saying and reminding people, well, maybe remind them, but everybody knows if they've got their mind about them at all, they're going to die. When are you going to die? You don't know. How are you going to die? I don't know. How long will it take your body to biologically die? You don't know. But you will die. And Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto man once to die, but then he reminds us, that's not the end of man. After that, the judgment. Paul said of us concerning the judgment, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. To give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Now, let me ask you something. If you don't have the power and the love and the sound mind created by your following the word of God, where are you going to get it? Where's it going to come from? Look around about you. The current events going on right now. If you could know of every one of them throughout the world right now, just see all of them. Then you could go back 100 years or 500 years or 1,000 years. What do you think you'd see? Any different? You're going to see people in trouble. You're going to see unsound minds. You're going to see people taking advantage of people, seeing people hurt people, wars, rumors of wars, famines, depressions, all kinds of trouble in the family and the home. All of it is always going to be there. Why? Because men as free moral agents have not gone to the source of their peace of mind. And if you don't have a sound mind, you don't have peace of mind. So the only way that a person can ever do that, having a proper concept of himself or herself, of everything about them, of things material and things spiritual, is receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. So I want you to look for a moment at developing this sound mind because I realize this is said really to Christians, those who have already heard the gospel, who have believed the gospel of Christ, who have obeyed the gospel of Christ. They're truly and genuinely converted to Christ. But it tells the person outside of Christ. Here is something for you if you will genuinely convert to Christ. That conversion process is where you're brought to a belief not only in God the Father, but in the deity of Christ as the Son of God and that He came to save you from your sins. Sins you got yourself into. Sins the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3 verse 4. And we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. And the wages of sin is death, meaning separation from God, Romans 6, 23. Now what are we going to do about that? Well, there's only one way to go. And that is to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes of the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Now, the person that does that also obeys the commandment, having believed in Christ, to repent of sins, Acts 17, 30. What does that mean? It means from here on out, I will not follow my own impulses that come through 
the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, a physical thing for a material world. Those things I won't do. But I will be guided by the testimony of my Lord, whom I've been brought to belief in, and turn from a practiced life of sin. And I'm willing, Romans 10, 10, to confess Christ as the Son of God and obey Him in being baptized in Christ for the remission of sins by His authority. Acts 2, 38, Romans 6, 3 and 4, and Galatians 3, 27. Now, I'm speaking to folks, as Paul was here, who have done that. Sound mind, you began at that point. You're a new creature in Christ because your whole outlook on life is different. It's totally different. Now, the key at this point, and it was true of Timothy, and that's one reason that Paul is writing to Timothy, the key to a sound mind here is endurance. It's endurance you got to stick with it. You don't hit or miss. You're not up one day and down the next. You don't read your Bible one day and skip two months and read it again. But you stick with it. That's what's meant by being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I think you know, as well as I do, that even in this life, to accomplish something, you don't start and quit. Start and quit. Now, I'm not saying quitting that which is contrary to God's will, quitting that which is sinful. We ought to quit those things. But I'm talking about just making it in life. You keep at it. You keep at it. Jesus said, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew chapter 24 verse 13. Well that's just a great principle. But it certainly touches on living for God. I fear there are far too many who have begun the race as a Christian. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. But as was discussed by Jesus in Luke 9 62 they only turn back. They turn back. I see people very zealous when they get started out, but they slow down. And sometimes just completely quit. And in reality, what they've done is prove themselves unworthy of the crown of life, 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8, which Paul says that he had attained because he endured. This is what Paul says. Now, this is the statement a person can make at the end of a life of diligently and steadfastly serving God. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, now he's going to talk about us and everybody else that becomes a Christian, but unto all them also that love is appearing. God wants everybody that obeys the gospel to endure so they can make that statement at the end of their life. And we need to so live. We have already seen in my lifetime, and especially the last half of my life to this point, So many brethren back off from the true pattern of New Testament Christianity. Other things interest them. I don't know how much you keep up with things, but churches dwindle in population, in number. Many congregations are shutting the doors. What is that the fault of? That could be several things. One of them is what we're talking about now. Brethren are prone to want to go with the world. The world has a lot to offer as far as this life is concerned. Sin is pleasurable, but it's only for a season. And there are many consequences to gratifying the pleasures of sin. 
And the Bible tells us plainly that the devil is a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. So he won't let up. But at the same time, we're taught, as James said, resist the devil, he will flee from you. You, you realize the devil's a coward. Resist him, he'll run. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. So we see then what he said. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense and reward. Then notice what he says. And patience, remember, in the New Testament means bearing up under great pressures, especially those brought upon you because you are a Christian. Because regardless of those pressures and pains and torments brought upon you because you're a Christian, it doesn't change the Word of God. So for you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Then he says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we're not of them which draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now we're sort of back to what Paul said to Timothy. God has given us not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A whole lot of the world's problems mentally and emotionally will be cured if people had the sound mind that only the gospel offers. I always say this because I want people to understand. I'm not talking about somebody being out of their mind through a blow to the head, through cancer, through some sort of chemical imbalance they cannot help. I'm talking about a normal human being who knows he or she's accountable to God or is accountable to God whether they know it or not. A person who can reason and think and know when they're honest or they're not, and therefore know when they're thinking honestly or not. So I learned then that as Paul writes to Christians to make sure they keep that sound mind and cultivate it, Philippians 3, 13 through 14, forgetting the things which are behind. There are a host of people right now that are haunted by their past. Whether imaginary, or whether things that actually happened to them, they worry about it. Worry is taking thought about that which you can do absolutely nothing about. So I hear it all the time and have for a long time. You know my family life. It was terrible. I had a terrible mother. I had a terrible father. or It was all broken up. Or whatever. If you're old enough to recognize that you had those things and know that you stand now out from under those things, then you can start to work to not let them control you. You're not now. Forgetting those things that are behind, well, it doesn't mean you can erase them from your memory. It means you don't let them stop you from doing what you now know is true. You're a new creature in Christ. You're a child of God. Your past sins have been forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. All those things do is pull you back to where you where the old man was before he was baptized. Notice how he says, in reaching forward or stretching forward to the things which are before, a Christian stays optimistic. And by that, I don't mean they're always like a bunch of cheerleaders bouncing around, leading everybody in cheers. I mean, as long as you're in possession of your mind and your will, you think through things. You look forward. Have you ever noticed that when Paul in the same letter in which Paul says the time of my departure is at hand, I know I'm going to die. Tradition has that he was taken out to the mile marker or something like that, the city marker of Rome when it came time to execute him because he's a Roman citizen and there they beheaded him. He knew it was coming. In that same letter he says bring me the parchments. Does that tell you something about Paul, even knowing that he's going to die shortly, he still was studying. He still was reaching 
ahead. He was following exactly what he says here. I press on toward the goal of the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's still that desire to go ahead and to go on and to learn and to become better as long as you have control of yourself and therefore responsible to God and how you live on earth, you keep wanting to know more. So we must strive a little harder each day. That's how you fight the fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6, 12. That's how you remain steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. If you don't do that, how do you do these things? Prayer, confession of sin. Let us be thankful that we are sharply conscious of our weaknesses. How would we ever change and grow out of them and work on them if we could recognize them? It's the faithful child of God striving to oppose sin, become more like Christ, who's going to recognize their shortcomings and weaknesses. It's the people who love this present world who love the flesh, who live for the here and now, who never get any thought of death and the judgment of heaven or hell, they don't ever consider their sins. It just comes a matter of, well, that's his opinion. That's what he likes. Let him do it or whatever. I think the saddest of all sad things will be the person in the judgment who had at one time been a faithful child of the living God but died out of duty. That is, having been caught up in a trespass, but would not repent of it, and gone farther and farther away from the truth. Or as is said by Peter, went back to the beggarly elements of the world. Why would we do that? Evidently a lot of people have, because the very New Testament itself, as it was being written, warned of an apostasy. And 1 Timothy 4 tells us how that happens. And it's plain about it. That's why Paul starts that little passage off, Thou the Spirit speaketh expressly. The Spirit speaks, the Spirit speaks words, the Spirit speaks them expressly, which means he speaks them plainly. What is it that the Spirit spake? That some shall depart from the faith. They cannot leave what they were not, never a part of. They're in it. They're living. But in time longer time for some than others they depart giving heed to, su to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons false doctrine appealed to them somewhere or the other they listened it persuaded them it looked good now nothing happened to them that didn't happen to Eve in the garden did she know the will of God yes she could quote it right back to the serpent but then she let the flesh take over. And she looked on the fruit. It was good for food. Something desired to make one wise. I don't know how, but it did. And so on. And she believed the devil's lie. She was deceived. And she obeyed it. And that brings about sin. And what's interesting when you read about what we've just been talking about, about those people who have fallen away and returned, as Peter said, to the beggarly elements of the world. The Lord talked about people like that and basically said better they had never been born. I wish we could realize no matter how, let's just put it this way, no matter how rotten an upbringing you had and how sorry your parents were in teaching and training you, when you were born in this world, you were given the opportunity of eternity in heaven with your God. We all too often let the things around us influence us. Now granted, the Bible has so much to say about husband, wife, mom, and daddy and the importance they have over rearing the children properly, training them up the way they should go. Because they must be prepared to live this life as long as they're here. But, of course, the kingdom comes first, and they must be taught that too. But think for a minute. 
If I'm born in this world and I'm capable of thinking enough to know and be aware of my surroundings, no matter how bad they are, why can't I be fully persuaded by the truth of God? And see people in the Bible that had terrible surroundings, but they did not let those things stop them from rendering obedience to God. They didn't let the influence of people, whether in their family or their best friends, whether it's mother, daddy, sibling, or son or daughter, whoever, draw them away from doing what they knew the Word said. But if you're like Eve, you see how it happens. One of the most beautiful portraits I think, that had ever been pictured, and I know what it's been in my life, is that of the devoted to God, older Christian, who has grown in the likeness of Christ for many years, and now toward the end of their days, they show you by their life what's important, where everybody ought to go, for he's made it to the final lap. Glory lies just ahead. You see that in Paul. And remember to whom he originally wrote that. That young man was told to make full proof of thy ministry. He did the same thing with Titus. They were going to be there going on and taking up where Paul left off. And he knew how they should walk, how they should do, what they should believe. So there's the enduring way. There's the importance of steadfastness. To stick with it. No matter what anybody's done behind you or with you or what they do right now, think of Noah. What was going on all around him while he was building that ark for years? They had never seen a flood. They didn't know anything about such a thing. But yet, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, moved with fear, built an ark to the saving of his house. To the saving of his house, his family. Noah, Ms. Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and each one of their wives say true to God at that time. And they were saved on the ark. All the rest of the people around them, they must have ridiculed them. They must have mocked them. But they didn't determine what was right and what was wrong. Now, if at the end of time we can truly say, as Paul did, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith, 2 Timothy 4, 7. Then we can also expect what Paul expected, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to all those who remain, however long they're on this earth, faithful in his service. Well, we pointed out in the beginning that a penitent believer who is baptized is put into Christ. They're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. But now the tests come. Not saying there aren't tests before that to stop you from doing what God said to become a Christian, but now you're a Christian. I can't think of anything that would make the devil even matter than what he is at the world and to know he lost somebody. That person actually rejected his deception and believed the gospel and obeyed it. And all of his past sins are washed away and the Lord's put him in the church. So he may quadruple his efforts to get after you and after me. But we too can expect the crown of righteousness if we persevere. Because when we rise to the water of the grave of baptism, we're now going to have to go in for the long haul. We're going to have to endure if heaven's to be our home. So we begin our spiritual walk by being baptized as pens of believers into Christ. 
And now we must endure by remaining loyal to him, by being faithful to him. And what awaits at the end? Oblivion. We're promised hell will not be our home. We are promised eternal life in heaven where there's no sin, no possibility of sin, no one to make sin, but glorified even as the Lord is glorified. John said we don't know what we'll be like, but we'll be like him. Now the question as we bring the lesson to an end, are you enduring? Are you sticking with it? Are you steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? Do you realize that to become like Christ takes time, takes effort? And that's talking about growing up in Christ, growing spiritually. Some things you may have to fight harder than you did other things. To bring your mind, remember our mind, into subjection to Jesus Christ and mold your character into the likeness of Christ. But I tell you this, without the gospel, God's power to save us, Romans 1.16, and our belief and obedience from the heart to it, you'll never have the sound mind. But there will be a nagging, horrible fear. Because God has set eternity in our hearts. Am I ready to meet my Lord? That question you can answer if you're not ready. And you can know what to do about it. If you need to obey the gospel, we've studied what that is to do that. As a child of God, do you consider yourself steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing all these things shall be added unto us? If there's error in your life that needs to be corrected, now's a good time with the motivation of the truth to correct it in repentance, confession of sin, and prayer to God for forgiveness. So if you need to respond to the blessed invitation, let this sermon, let the song we're about to sing encourage you and resist Satan. He'll flee from you and respond to the gospel while we stand and while we sing.